Well, 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 yeah. Is it that the Nigerian judiciary has been so enmeshed into politics that it's difficult to separate it from politics? It's not that it's been so immersed in politics. It has been performing its role whenever it's called upon. But more and more, we are seeing the judiciary as part of the political process. We must be able to separate the judiciary from the political process and have an understanding of the role of the judiciary as an arbiter in matters involving legal contest, not matters revolving political contest as people jumping over, you know, <laughs> over fences, yeah, that's, that's a question. wrong use of, you know, or, or, of police, or, or wrong use of uh, DSS, as you are seeing in Lagos State. Mm -hmm. These are things that there are judgments that have been given. Let me give you an example. The DSS thing that we are talking about in Lagos State was what brought down the regime of President Nixon interfering into the political arena space of opposition without the due process of law in an election era, having access to information of the opposition without the due process of law. I, I think there are so many things that are cascading on us that as we are grappling with one thing that seems strange in a democratic you know, dispensation, you find another extension of, are we in a military regime? No, we are not. Mm. And if we are not, there are law reports. What, what, what is the role of the Attorney General of the, of the Federation? Is he giving sound advice to the executive? Because he is the chief legal officer. So, Prof. Dr. Kepa, that's well, but the question I asked about separating politics from, from the legal framework of the country. The Attorney General of the Federation yes. and the Minister of Justice, yes. both of them are in one office, appointed by the President. How do you think he'll be effective in giving that legal advice as desired? Well, that has been observed. Even the National Assembly in its current constitutional reform that it has sent to the State Houses of Assembly contains the separation of the political office of you know, uh, Minister, of Minister of Justice and yes. that of the Attorney General. Uh, under the 1960 1963 Constitution, this was separated even though vested in the office of the Director of Public Prosecution, which was made independent. More and more, over the period of time, the Office of Attorney General and Minister of Justice now, you know, oops that function that we had under the military. Uh, and more and more, we don't see it as being independent. It's supposed to be because of, it's, what, it's the only constitutionally reserved professional office because of the, the value the Constitution plays upon it. But over the years, it's, 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 it's been compromised. Now, you know, usually when elected officers are elected and they're about to take their oath of office, one of the things that they promise to uphold is the Constitution, yes. promise to protect it and also uphold the rule of law. Yes. Is that, Th that vow, as it were, that oath, is it something that they can be prosecuted on? The vow does not constitute a basis for prosecution, but it constitutes a basis for valuation and judgment call when it comes to period of election. When you start compromising the processes that will ensure rule of law, when parties, political parties, don't have you know, con contest to evaluate people into office, and you have automatic tickets, it compromises the rule of law. Because we cannot say that we are going to judge you over a period of time where you have performed. And we know that in Nigeria, once you are in office, there is the political power, there is the financial power, and in fact, institutional authority that if you decide to compromise the system, you can easily do it, particularly in a fragile, democratizing state like Nigeria. So the office of the president can easily, you know, because the president is the leader of the political party. So it's not surprising that the PDP, for instance, uh, the president, we had a transformation agenda of Nigeria singing on telly, uh, 70 something million Nigerians begging the president. What do they mean to beg the president? You know, these are things that when you see, you start to ask yourself, people don't relate it to the rule of law. But all these, they have impact on the rule of law. If you are not going to play politics 
or rule in accordance with constitutional guidelines and in accordance to legal processes. Don't forget that beyond the Constitution, we have laws that deal with political parties. We have internal democracy <coughs> that political parties are supposed to have. If we don't have internal democracy, of course, once internal democracy is compromised at the political party level, Whatever you are going to do on election day is compromised. So the reason we ask this question, I remember sometime in 2007 or so when uh, the governor of um, uh, Anambra State, then, then governor of Anambra State, Peter Obi, uh, was, uh, he won his case in the court of law against the ruling party, the PDP. We recall then that President Omar Rigeretua asked the police to swing into action to ensure that the you know in. exactly that yeah. he's sworn in and and that the yeah. court processes was actually followed the court ruling was followed now a lot of people commended that but some people also criticized that and saying that you know the executive yes much as it implements certain decisions of the judiciary did not need to come in in that particular matter so other people felt that it was also a signal how important is the action of an office holder in terms of upholding the rule of law when it comes to the judiciary? Some people feel that it means that the judiciary is being subsumed under the executive. Some other people feel that, you know, it's just the executive showing that they support the rule of law. You see, the judiciary is a very interesting arm of government. It doesn't invite people to come before it, but people come. When it decides matters, people celebrate. It doesn't have the authority to even implement the orders that it makes unless somebody moves for the order to be implemented. So basically, the, the, the judiciary exists under several legal and constitutional concepts. Separation of powers is one of them. And in the separation of powers, is for each arm of government to recognize the order in the performance of its role. So if the legislature, for instance, is performing its role, we don't expect the executive to interfere. If the judiciary gives a judgment, we expect it to be respected. A situation where judiciary gives an order and an arm of government does not respect it is what we call executive lawlessness. And that is what we are experiencing where we have judicial decided authorities on certain political practices and people, even against these decided authorities, will take actions yeah. that will go against it. That is breakdown of rule of law. Uh, I, I'm happy you're talking about actions and what people can do, or trying to look at the uh, legislature and the executive arm. And uh, now uh, we'll take a look at the, at the tweet here uh, for you. Uh, it is from Nigerian Youth Arise saying, the seating took place. Yeah, it is wrong that they scaled the gate. But Prof, if they didn't do that, Tambua would have been impeached. That's from Nigerian Youth Arise. Let's link that to what happened in Ikiti State. Uh, and uh, I don't know, you, you should also tell us what the Constitution says about two-third majority. Yeah. Uh, hashtag Ikiti. And the governor has gone on to say he will recognize uh, the new speaker. What, what, what's the implication? Well, Ikiti State um, is, um, is, is like, to borrow my Atlantic colleagues, uh, you know, Fal Falano, he, he predicted this, uh, you know, theater of comedy, uh, even though a, a macabre kind of comedy. Uh, we, we, we knew that there was bound to be conflict because it was a situation where the governor coming in was going to have to relate with opposition. And from the history of this particular governor, it was something that looked almost impossible for him to do, which is to use political maturity to relate with the, oppos uh, the opposition-dominated legislature that he inherited. But what did he do? From the first day that he got there, tried to convince them to defect. Those that defected, of course, are the ones that finally went to the hallowed chambers to impeach. But the leadership of the opposition and the speaker in that house refused to succumb. So the speaker started experiencing negative things. His filling station was, <laughs> the license to have it was revoked. And more importantly, 
there were allegations of threat to life. What did we do at that time? Was there a police investigation? Was there security? His, his aides were withdrawn from him. And then, of course, they went out of the state to gather outside the state. And the next day, we find seven people sitting in the hollow chambers of that house to impeach the speaker and to elect another speaker. These are things that the courts have ruled upon.